If you have your Bible, you can open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's where we're going to be. If you are a student, young or old, uh, if you were a student, you might have thought you were on Thanksgiving break, but I'm going to ask you to hang with me for just a minute and we'll let you back on Thanksgiving break uh, here in just a second because I have a math problem that I want to give you. But good news is you're not just being tested. There is a reward. I have a $10 Starbucks card for whoever gets this first. Okay, we're going to have a math problem that's going to come up on the screen and it's going to be an algebra problem and you're going to solve for X. Now there's other variables and you're gonna to be told what those values are for each of those. And if you, or when you know the answer, I want you to raise your hand and I'll be looking out here. First person to raise their hand, we're gonna see if you can get it right. If you get it right, you get $10 to Starbucks, which seems like a pretty decent deal. And then you could go back on Thanksgiving break, all right? So here is the equation right here, solve for X. First hand, first hand I see. All right, I saw one right back here. What is it? Zero, that is the correct answer. I have a Starbucks card for you after the service. The answer is zero. Now you might say, why did I do that? By the way, you're back on Thanksgiving break. Okay, so no more schoolwork now for a week at least. Uh, but why did I do that? Because this passage we're talking about, Paul Starks starts with an equation that looks exactly like that as he's describing what love is. So today we're talking about what is love? But I want, to, I want you to know in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the chapter right before it, many people, if you've been around church for very long, you might have heard it. It talks about spiritual gifts, that all of us who are in Christ, if, you have, if you've received Christ, you also have the Holy Spirit who gives you spiritual gifts and how you and I can use those spiritual gifts to build up the body. Just like you, your body, you have all these different parts working together to do what you need to do. And he talks about that none of the parts are more important than the other. The important part is that all of them are working together for the same purpose in the body of Christ. So he talks about all this kind of stuff and how, and it is encouraging and challenging the church at Corinth to use their spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ all together, everybody doing their part all together. But then he says at the end, he says, and I will show you a more excellent way. And that's where we pick up right here. And here's the equation. Verse one in chapter 13. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, if I have the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues or eloquence, I can speak great words. Now we can look at that in all different ways, but he says, if I have this eloquence and I have this incredible gift, then, but I don't have love, he says, I'm only noise. All that comes out of my mouth is just noise. Verse two, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy, I can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. He says, you could be a prophet. You can have all understanding. You can have all knowledge, not some knowledge, not most knowledge. He says, you can have all knowledge and you can have faith that move mountains. But if you don't have love, you might look at that first side and say, I have a lot. But if you don't have love, he says, you have nothing. He says, you are nothing. Verse three, he says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. He says, you can be generous, you can sacrifice, but if you don't have love, you gain nothing. I wanna point out that he even says here, he says that even acts of self-sacrifice and even acts of generosity can have the wrong motive and be self-serving. Now we know this because there's a whole lot of people who give a lot of money But we also understand that some people really just do that to kind of ease their own conscience, right? Now, I had somebody ask me a couple years ago when uh, it looked like maybe churches were going to lose tax-exempt status and stuff like that. They said, what's going to happen to the church? Don't you think that will destroy the church when church loses its tax-exempt status? Because when people give to a tax-exempt organization, you can do it as a write-off on your taxes, right? And they're saying, so if people won't be able to write it off, what if giving goes down and now the church, won't that destroy the church? And here's what I said. I said, what we'll find out when that day comes is who's really tithing and who's getting a tax write-off. And guess what? What's interesting about that is I said, no matter what happens, God is gonna take care of his church. The church isn't gonna be destroyed because of a tax exemption or not tax exemption, but we are gonna find out who's tithing and who's not. And I actually said that actually might be a healthier thing for the church than people getting tax write-offs for tithing. 
It might actually be a healthier thing because some people just do that, just give for a tax write-off. And Paul is kind of talking about this, that you can have generosity, you can have all these other kinds of things, you can sacrifice yourself. And he says, you can all, you can still end up without love, you could still end up gaining nothing. Now we have that equation, we're we'll bringing that equation back up and you'll see, I said solve for X and basically what the picture was, you wonder what all those different letters were. If you have 365 days, of eloquence, of speaking great words, spiritual words, all that kind of stuff. 365 days of all knowledge, all wisdom, and you have 365 days of generosity. Guess what? When you, when you calculate that left side in the parentheses, some of the junior hires are like, I don't know what they're talking about. That's all right. But when you calculate that left side, that is a really, really big number. It's a very large number. But here's the problem. Paul gives the equation. He says, it doesn't matter how large that number is on that side. Those are all important things. Those are great things. Remember, he just said, if you have these gifts, you should be using them. But he says, if you have all those, but you have a zero in the love category, the answer is still zero. It's exactly zero. Not less than something, not like, well, I have all this great stuff, but because I don't have love, it's just a little bit less. No, he says, it's exactly zero. I read a book this uh, week by Bob Lapine. It's called Love Like You Mean It. It's a fantastic book. It's on this passage. One of the best books I've read in, in quite a while. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about because we're just walking through this passage is going to be some of the stuff that he talks about in his book. And it's fantastic. But the picture is that Paul is giving us in this passage. Can you imagine for just a second? Most Christians, if you're a Christian in this room, most people would say, if I had great spiritual gifts, and I used them well, and I had knowledge, and I could understand the depths of God's word. I could understand the depths of who he is. I knew everything, and I was extremely generous. I mean, and I had faith that could move mountains. I literally had such great faith. A lot of people in this room would say, that's the kind of faith I want to have. That's the kind of relationship with God I want to have. But Paul says, you know what? You can still have 100% of that, but if you have zero in love, it's not worth anything. Love is everything. So what is love? For all time, we've, we've asked the question, what is love? What is love really? And over time, there's been a lot of times that they'll ask kids, people ask kids, what is love? And it's always funny to hear some of their responses. So I looked at different responses from different seasons and generations of people. And here's some of the answers over time that kids have given. Karen, who is seven years old, said, when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> That's great. Terry, who is four, said, love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Aww. Rebecca, who's eight, said, when my grandmother got arth arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That is love. Aww. I think that's a good one. Bobby, who's seven, says, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. That's a great one. Maybe all of us should try that here in about a month, all right? Noel, who's seven years old, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and he wears it every day. <laughs> Emily, who is eight years old, said, love is when you kiss all the time. Then when you get tired of kissing, you still want to be together and you talk more. My mommy and daddy are like that. They look gross when they kiss. Nikki, age six, says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. I think that's actually a pretty deep, uh, insightful one, right? Tommy, who's six years old, said, love is like the little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Cindy, this is a good one for love of a parent. It's eight years old. She said, during my piano recital, excuse me, during my piano recital, I was on stage and I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and I saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that and I wasn't scared anymore. Mary Ann, who was four years old, said, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. <laughs> Jessica, eight years old, said, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it, but if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. And the final one I found that was really neat is an author and lecturer named Leo Buscaglia. And he once talked about a contest he was asked, asked to judge and they were trying to find the most caring child. And the winner was a four-year-old. And the four-year-old had a neighbor whose wife had passed away and um, he saw the man crying and the little boy went over to the 
uh, gentleman's yard, climbed up on his lap and just sat there. And then when he came back home, his mom asked him what he had said to his neighbor, and the little boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. So let me ask you a question. We have a lot of great definitions of love, a great picture, some of them funny, some of them silly, some of them actually pretty insightful from little kids. But if I asked you to define love, what is love? What would you say? When I do premarital counseling with couples, I'll ask them, what is love? We'll discuss how they define love. And Paul is going to define love for us. Here's how he starts out. Starts out in verse four. Love is patient. Now, I don't know about you, but when I, made, when I asked you to think about how you would define love, I'm guessing that not many of you, unless you knew this passage, would have started with that one, right? Not many of us would have started with love is patient. That seems like a really odd place to start. This word patient means to put one's anger or wrath far away. But that's a weird place to start. Paul basically says, before we start talking about some of these other things that might make your heart warm, I want you to know that if you're really going to love, and this word love is a different kind of love. This is the word agape, which is unconditional, anyhow, no matter what comes, I love you. That's the kind of love he's talking about. That's the original word that's used here. And it was a unique word, by the way. It was a unique word, but he uses this word and he says, if you're going to love people, you have to be patient. Before we talk about the things that warm your heart, I want you to know that it's going to be hard work to love people this way. I want you to know that you're going to have to stick it out. You're going to have to deal with a lot. You're going to have to be patient. The first thing when he's defining it, he says, first, it's going to be hard. I want you to know love is patient. Alistair Begg says this, agape love is not coziness, it's not affection or a predisposition on the basis of attraction, it is a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual discipline for you and I to love people this way in marriage, in friendships, our kids, our parents, our neighbors, anybody we come across, it is a spiritual discipline for us to do this and it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If you have receive Jesus and you've received the Holy Spirit as the seal, guess what? It also comes with spiritual gifts that we talked about and it comes with the fruit of the Spirit. But you have to walk in the Spirit to experience the fruit of the Spirit. For you and I to do this, to be patient with people in this way, it's a fruit of the Spirit. This is the picture that Paul talks about. And I want to point out as we, we're going to kind of burn through these pretty quick because there's a lot here to understand what love is and really what love does as well. But I want to point out that we see every single one of these things in God in who God is and how he relates to us. We see every one of them. And we also see him in the way he teaches us to love one another. Now, love is patient. What did Jesus say? When somebody strikes you on the cheek, what do you do? Strike them back, right? Nope. He says, turn the other cheek. Give him another chance. When somebody asks you to go one mile, which soldiers in that day could say, I want you to carry my gear for one mile. And they had to carry it one mile. He says, you know what? That might be an inconvenience to you, but what I'm going to tell you to do, I'm going to tell you to take it another mile. I'm going to tell you to go further than that. When people don't treat you well, what am I going to tell you to do? Love them and pray for them. Love your enemies. This is the kind of stuff that Jesus taught us because love is patient. The second thing, is love is kind. Now, New Testament scholars actually believe that Paul made up the word that's used here. In ancient Greek, uh, the word krestos was the word that meant kind, and it was a noun. The word kind is a noun, that word. But Paul actually uses this word in a way that was never found anywhere else. It was always a noun, and he writes the word kresteumai. It actually turns it into a verb, kind of like the word Google right? Google is a noun. It is something that, that you, it was, it was a website, but what does it become? Now it's not just something. Now it's something you do, right? It's not just a noun anymore. It's a verb. Now you Google things, right? Paul turns the word kind into a verb and he talks about kindness. He puts kindness into motion. Alexander Strzok says this, kindness is love in work clothes. This word actually became a label for Christians in the early church. Tertullian, who was an ancient his, historian, says that in the early days of the church, Christians were sometimes called the Christiani, which was compared with the Christiani, which means the Christ ones. It's actually a play on words that they would take the word the Christ ones, they would call them the, Christ, the Christiani, which meant they were the kind ones. 
That to be ones who are following Jesus means that you're going to be kind. And they use this kind of play on words. But here's what's interesting. They're no different than us. They weren't better people than us. They weren't better Christians than us. They, they didn't have less temptations and struggles than us or anything like that. They were still predisposed in the same way that you and I are to not be kind. So if they were described that way, we should be described that way. If we're Christians, we should be known for our love and for our kindness. But how do we develop this? We develop it by reflecting on who God is and the kindness that he gives to us. Michael Card says this, he says, the great surprise of the Hebrew Bible is not that God is awesome or holy. These are characteristics that we would expect from God. The great surprise is that he is kind, that he is a God of hesed, which that word means loving kindness. It's not a surprise that he's amazing. It's not a surprise that he's awesome, not a surprise that he's holy, but it is a surprise because we don't see this in any other religion, in anybody else, except for the one true God that he is also the God of loving kindness. And when we reflect on the God of loving kindness, it gives us the opportunity and the ability to be that and to reflect that as well. Next thing is love is humble. It does not envy, verse four, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Now this word proud, the word arrogant is used seven times in the New Testament. But what's interesting is six of the times, six out of the seven times in the New Testament, this word is used for arrogant or proud. It's used in this letter that Paul writes to the people in the church of Corinth, because this was a major issue for them. So how do we humble ourselves? If we're going to be humble, if we're not going to be proud, if we're not going to be boastful, how do we humble ourselves? Jeremiah 9 says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast in their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have understanding to know me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. For you and I to be humble, we have to remember that we have nothing apart from the Lord. We have nothing to offer anybody apart from the Lord, everything you have of any value has been given to you by the Lord. And when we reflect on who he is, it humbles us and puts us in the right position. The next one is close to it. Love is generous. Love is generous. It says, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. There's a story of a mom who was making cookies and she had two boys and the boys were fighting over who would get the first cookie. I know if you have two boys in your house, that would never happen in your house, right? But they, she was making cookies. The boys were fighting over who would get the first one. She said, you know what? I'm going to use this and make it a teachable moment. And so she told her boys, she said, you know what Jesus would do right now? In this moment, he would say to the other person, why don't you take the first one? And the older boy responded, you get to be Jesus. That's how all of us are, right? Because it's really difficult. It's not easy to not be self-seeking because guess what? We love ourselves. Terrell Owens, old football player, used to walk around on the sideline and shout out, I love me some me. I love me some me. That's what he would say. He loved himself. And guess what? The truth is we might not shout it out, but by our actions, we love me some me. All of us. By our actions, we do that. We want things our way. And most of the time, we make a big deal if it doesn't go our way. But this is the picture of being generous. It's not about things being done your way. Now, there are times that things might need to be done your way. If you're a parent and your kids are playing out in the street, when my kids would play out in the street, I'd say, you don't get to do that. And it was a big deal. And I actually wanted to make sure that it was my way. Because guess what? My way, what I was talking about was in their best interest. It wasn't just in my best interest. It was really in their best interest. And so that's why I can assert that authority at certain times. If you're a boss, if you have people that are working under you or a business owner or something, there may be times that your way is actually what's most important and you need to do that. But there are other times in our lives that where most of us mess up is when it's not really one of those situations. It's not the difference between right and wrong. It's not the difference between, you know, what benefits them versus what benefits us. It, it's, it's, we just say, you know what, this is what I want. That's when we get into trouble. That's when we have problems. There are times, again, God even insists that things are done his way. Do you know why he insists that we do things his way and we live life his way? Not because it's what's best for him, because it's what's best for us. That's the picture that he gives. 
The next thing is love is forgiving. It says it's not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Resentment and bitterness destroy all kinds of relationships. The Bible says that you and I should forgive as the Lord forgave us. Now, I want you to think about this for just a second. How has God forgiven you? How has God forgiven you? To what extent has he forgiven you? Here's the extent. When you are an enemy of his, when you're against him, with your back to him, guess what he did? He pursued you so much that he said, I love you even though you're against me, even though you're an enemy of mine. I love you so much that I'm gonna send my son Jesus to come and pay the price that you deserve to pay because the punishment, the wages of our sin is death and separation from God. God says, I love you. And he said, he loved me so much that he sent his son to pay the debt that you and I owed. The sin that has been forgiven by his work on the cross. And here's what's interesting about it. The thing I love about it. The Bible says, we hear people all the time say, you know what, you know what God does? He forgives and forgets. I want you to know God doesn't forget. You don't find that anywhere in scripture. God doesn't forget. Here's what the Bible says. It says it in Jeremiah, also says it in Hebrews. God doesn't forget. He chooses to remember no more. God is not forgetful. It didn't slip his mind who we were. No, it was the exact opposite. It was so much more loving that he said, you know what, that might be true, but I am taking that idea and I'm putting it out of my mind when I look at you. I choose actively to remember no more. The Bible says that God separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. By the way, that's not East Houston to West Houston. And that's not even on the planet. That's in the universe that he has created. That's pretty far that God would separate our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. We have a really small picture of east to west. God has a really big picture. And God's word says that he separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. He has forgiven you. And guess what? You will never, ever, ever have to forgive somebody to the extent that God has had to forgive you. And the Bible says that we should forgive in that same way. There's never anybody that's going to sin against you personally to the extent that you and I, and the number of times that you and I have sinned against God, but God is a God of forgiveness. So for some of you today, you need to know God loves you. He paid the price for your sin and offers you that forgiveness today. And if you've received that forgiveness, guess what? We should be offering it to other people. The next is that love is virtuous. It does not delight. Love does not delight in evil. Do you know that we don't love people by rejoicing at wrongdoing? There's a whole lot of people in our world right now, even a lot of people that claim the name of Jesus, who would say, well, if we're going to love people, we're going to love all people and we're going to celebrate them and who they are and just let them be. No, that's not, that's not actually what love is. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. We don't love people by affirming or supporting sinful behaviors. That's not what we do. It's not loving to enable sin. And you have to remember, Paul is writing to a group of people, to a church of people who are known to be carnal people who lived in a city that was notorious for immorality. These people that he's writing to in the church of Corinth, there was division, there was quarreling and fighting, there was sexual immorality. They even had times where they would have people that would come to take up communion, to take the Lord's Supper and use it as an opportunity to get drunk. And then they would, they would affirm themselves and they would, uh, they would give themselves acclamations and accolades and talk about how spiritual they are. This was the people he's writing to. And he says, we don't affirm this kind of work. They would commend themselves for being spiritual. And Paul, Paul's like, you guys are a train wreck and you don't even know it. It's a mess what's happening there, but it's impossible to love God and to love other people and rejoice in wrongdoing. This is what Paul's saying. But on the other side of that, We have to be careful we don't fall into self-righteousness. To rejoice in wrongdoing, and there's some people who say, you know what, I would never rejoice in wrongdoing. I would never do that. In fact, I'm gonna let people know and make sure that people know that they are wrong. Now listen, there are times very clearly in scripture that we're gonna take a stand, but here's what happens. What happens is that a lot of Christian people look at a person and yell at a person or are harsh to a person about who they are. The Bible doesn't talk about it that way. What did Jesus do when the woman was caught in adultery? First of all, he kind of created space for grace. And then he said, I don't condemn you, 
but go and sin no more. He said, first, I love you. I'm going to offer you my love. I'm going to offer you my grace, but I'm also going to tell you the truth. What a lot of people want to do is they say, you know what? I know there's something wrong. And first thing, I want them to know that there's something wrong. And we have a world where you and I can do that. You can send a text message. You can send a tweet. You can post a comment. You can do all these kinds of things in just a moment and let anybody know how you feel at any given time. We don't have to wonder how people feel. But you know what people do have to wonder? Are they loved? When it comes to Christians, when it comes to those of us who follow Christ, they should never wonder if they're loved. They should know first that they're loved. And this is the picture. The next thing is love is honest. Verse six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love doesn't hide things. I know all of us in this room, every single one of us in this room, one of the things that we want, probably almost more than anything else, is to be fully known and fully loved. To be fully known and fully loved. But here's the, here's the fear for all of us. All of us kind of fear, every one of us has this kind of fear that we, we know that if we were fully known, we wouldn't be fully loved. We have that fear in our minds, in our hearts. And so what we do is we hide things. We think, I don't want them to know this because if they knew this, they would think differently of me. Now, God is the only one who can do it perfectly, who fully knows us, fully knows you, and still fully loves you. God is the only one who does it perfectly 100% of the time. But all of us have that fear. The guy who wrote that book that I was telling you about told the story of uh, his wife sent him to the grocery store and gave him a list of items to get. And he said, and I, I relate to this, he said, when I get a list of items, I still go up and down every aisle in case there's something that's not on that list that I find out I want, right? And I'm one of those kind of people. But he said he bought a bag of Cheetos and he knew that his wife wouldn't be happy with him for buying a bag of Cheetos. So he said, when I got home, I took the bag of Cheetos and I left them in the garage where she wouldn't see them. And then I went inside and took all the groceries that were on the list and put them on the counter. And she said, she said, so this is, this is everything that I asked for. And he said, yep, that's all the groceries. And, and she said, well, this receipt says there's Cheetos. Where are the Cheetos? He said, I was busted. Now he told the truth. He got what was on the list, but he didn't tell all the truth because he was afraid that she might think of him different. Now she definitely did after he lied, right? But let me ask you a question. What are the things that are kind of like that, that you'd hold back because you're afraid somebody might find out? and think differently of you. Can you imagine if we, had, if we were all honest, out of love we were honest? If you're married, can you imagine if you knew 100% of the time there was a 0% doubt in your mind that your spouse was being 100% honest all the time? Now, you might say, that's weird. Like, I feel like my spouse is honest. We all have that, but we all know that every single one of us have things that we're ashamed of, things that we're guilty of, things that we might try to hide, or it might be a bag of Cheetos. It might be something that stupid, that simple but we all know we have that inside of us, right? But what if over years of knowing that you were honest 100% and they were honest 100%, do you know what kind of relationship you can build that's based on honesty like that? If you knew. Now, for some of us, we think of like liar, liar, and we're like, I don't, I'm scared of what would happen if every time they asked me a question, I had to be completely honest because my heart is, is wicked and evil, right? So some terrible things might come out. But love is honest. Love doesn't hide. And we can build all our relationships on truth like that. The next thing is love is tenacious. It says it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That's kind of funny as I think through this. I, I thought of a sports fan because that's what sports fans do. Always protect, always trust, always hoping, and always persevering, right? Like right now there are people putting on their face paint for the Texans game right now, or they probably already have it on. They're at the game and they're ready to roll. And you know what? The team hasn't really like been awesome and amazing. Uh, if you're a Cowboys fan, you do this every year, right? You say, this is our year. We know this is our year. And so far, it hasn't been that year for almost 30, okay? So, but like, <laughs> if you're a Cowboys fan, you still do that, right? All of us, if we're dedicated to a team, we love our team and we're always hoping the best. We're like, this could be it. Like, I want what's best. I want the team to succeed. Listen, if we had that same desire, that same kind of love for people where we love them, we wanted them to succeed, we wanted the best, we were gonna protect them at all costs, we were gonna hope and trust that there's the best inside of them and this might be the moment that God brings it out, then we're gonna persevere in our love for them. That's the picture. 
that Paul gives. And the last thing he says in verse eight, love never fails. Love is unfailing. Another word that might be more apt for today is love is undefeated. This kind of love is undefeated. And here's what's interesting. When things that are not supposed to fail, fail, it's devastating. Think about just recently in Florida, the buildings that collapsed, right? You shouldn't walk into a building and feel like it's going to come down. Like that's just like, it's mind blowing to us. And it's so tragic when that kind of stuff happens. Cause you're like, that shouldn't happen. That is not supposed to fail. We know there's a lot of things in our life that could fail at any given moment. I've jumped out of a plane knowing that my chute, my parachute could fail, right? I believe that it wouldn't. That's why I did it, but I knew it could. There's a whole lot of things we know can fail and can go wrong. But when things we say should not ever fail, fail us, it's absolutely devastating. This type of love does not fail. Here's the problem. Our love for other people will at times fail because we are imperfect. But God's love is not like ours. Here's what Lamentation says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's love for you will never, ever fail. And when we receive that kind of love, we can offer that kind of love to other people. There's an old saying that says, hurt people, hurt people. If you've been hurt, It's not unusual for you to be somebody that hurts other people. I want you to know something that's the opposite is true. Loved people who've received this agape, unconditional, anyhow, no matter what type of love, loved people, love people. If you want to know how you can love people this way, it starts with receiving that love yourself. Phil Riken says, no one will ever hear the gospel from the life of a loveless Christian. We want people to see Jesus. It's going to start with love. It doesn't matter anything else we do. If we don't have love, it's nothing. We see it all over our world today. What if the people in this room left this place and said, we're going to be a people of love? We're going to be people who live love and give love. The only way we're going to do it is if we are first people who receive that love from God.